Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to my last lecture today. Uh, there are very, very few people at FSCJ who can actually get me to wear a tie any longer. Jennifer Gray and Carrie Roth are two of those individuals. I don't even think Dr. A could get me to wear a tie any longer. But for whatever reason, when Carrie calls, uh, I uh, try to answer the call and I, I try to look and appear professional uh, at his request. So, welcome to my last lecture series today. I have to tell you, there was a few different ideas I had uh, as a political scientist and as somebody who teaches poli-sci uh, here at the Deerwood Center. One thing I was going to talk about today was the use of logical fallacy uh, and logical fallacy techniques in political debate, but I kind of de-emphasized that and scrapped that. I, I thought about trying to answer the question of how do we pay for it when somebody says, you know, well, we can't seem to have nice things in the United States because of debt and deficit and other things along those lines, so how do we get around that? And I, I put that away because I thought probably the most important thing that I could focus on to le the, this lecture uh, would be the American news media and where we stand today in the 21st century. Uh, relative to our news media coverage, what we're getting, and how we are actually processing the information that we receive from our favorite media outlets. Uh, so with that, today I'm going to do a little history of both print and electronic media in the United States very quickly. Uh, I would say that as somebody who practices what I call uh, principled nonpartisanship, that I will probably make everybody in the room, regardless of your political leanings, angry or upset at one point, <laughs> because I am an equal opportunity observer of when I see partisanship uh, and things that we'll talk about today towards the end of the class, like confirmation bias, uh, cognitive dissonance, which is the feeling of discomfort that we, we feel when we hear information that doesn't match up with our preconception of how we would like things to be ideologically or partisan-wise in the United States. So with that, we'll just get to the news media. And, and really, let's, you guys can see the slides and you're able to, to view what I have up here. Obviously, since this is my last lecture, terms in bold are what you're going to want to know for your quiz or for your examination moving forward. Uh, but let's talk about the importance of the news media and what role it actually is supposed to perform in the United States. It's a two-part function, right? It's both to inform and to function as a watchdog. None of us have the ability to go to Washington, D.C. on a daily basis and watch hearings and watch subcommittee hearings and watch panel discussions based on the policy. We rely on one of the seemingly 74 channels of C-SPAN to bring us that kind of information. And of course, there is those 74 channels of C-SPAN. But there's all kinds of coverage out there of the news media performing that role, that, which is both informative and as a watchdog. So really, uh, as I said, the focus today being on our mass media, which is information which is disseminated to us, the public, the mass public. Uh, the two prominent forms that we have are, of course, print and electronic media, what sometimes folks will refer to as digital media. Uh, and really, that's just going to change from political scientist to media observer to textbook to textbook. You may get a different, some folks calling it electronic, some folks calling it digital, however you want to refer to it as. Um, it's important to note, in the early days of this country, of the United States, we didn't have electronic media because we didn't have electricity. So when I teach young people today, and you guys are buried into your phones or your tech or your tablets or whatever the case, uh, you gotta remember when this nation started, uh, there was no electricity. I mean, this isn't even a matter of like, oh, well, my parents watched PBS or the 4 Chan. There was nothing, okay? There was, your basic only source of information, guys, was the print media. And for the reality of most Americans who were living in the English colonies, or as we entered in, we became a fledgling nation, of course, and 1776, our Declaration of Independence, and then the war which resulted from that for our, our, the Revolutionary War for our Independence, most Americans had no idea what was going on because they were also illiterate, okay? So when you're talking about our print media, you're really talking about media that in the early days of this country was being published for a select few individuals. And I want to emphasize the fact that it was blatantly partisan. Somehow people think or they have a misconception that the media somehow went awry at some point and it became very, very divisive and it became very, very political in terms of its coverage. It was that way from the get, all right? King George, American newspapers when we were colonies, you had to apply for a license to operate a print newspaper, okay? And quite frankly, if you printed information which was contrary to what the, what the king wanted to hear, you would have your license revoked. So we need to understand, of course, then American newspapers that didn't like the king would start to print things which were more pro-American. After the Revolutionary War, this turned into a conflict between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists about the ratification of our new Constitution. However, the point of it is, is that we have always kind of had this friction in our politics. 
this partisan friction, uh, which could be, you know, obviously politically party or issue based. All right, but there's always there's always been that kind of relationship in our media, and of course today we generally refer to people who cover the media as a journalist. Okay, and we'll get into a little bit about the journalists themselves here in a second. Print media in the 1800s began to really blow up with three big inventions. Okay, uh, when we think about the rise of print, the first is steam power and the use of rotary metal cylinders, which literally allowed paper to be printed on both sides as it went through a machine. This, the telegraph which literally allowed news to be sent electronically around the globe to find out what, you know, for example, European news outlets were covering our civil war in the United States and being able to telegraph that information back. Uh, and then, of course, literacy. What good is print media if you don't have anybody who can read? We know that the, the beginning of the common school program in the United States as basic uh, elements of literacy and mathematics began to increase as we began to, to educate the masses, uh, that print media really was able to take off. By the end of the 1800s, maybe you're familiar with the expression, the penny press, because it was also supposed to be affordable. We wanted the working man to be able to read, and I still use the term working man because there still wasn't as great an emphasis yet in the United States on educating women in that common school program. However, that was changing even in the 1800s. Okay? Uh, what else made newspapers popular? Political cartoons. Later in the early part of the 20th century, photography. Being able to take a newspaper article and then actually show a picture from where you're covering that information from. Whether it had been a war, whether it was the World's Fair, whatever the case may be. But uh, one other thing I'd like to stress too is that most American cities had a morning and an afternoon newspaper. People say why? Well, there's a good reason. Basically, uh, anything that happened overnight uh, wasn't going to make the morning paper because at some point they had to cut off, they had to set their type, they had to roll it. So the afternoon paper caught everything that happened overnight and then the early hours. Also, there was also an ideological component of this. Many times the morning paper was pro one political party while the afternoon paper was pro something else. Even as a kid who grew up in small town Pennsylvania, Watson Town, population 2,000 people, okay, in the middle of rural PA, in the middle of nowhere, what did we find? We had a morning paper, an afternoon paper, and then even a Sunday paper, which was special, called The Grit from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, okay? Uh, all of them with a different focus of coverage and a different ideological bent. Let's take a quick look at some of these cartoons just to give you guys an idea of the emphasis. And of course, Ed Hall, a local political cartoonist, has been kind enough to come to FSCJ on many occasions. He still does political cartooning today, which is basically using pictures to do what? Depict satire, and to basically help us visualize through the use of cartoons what's going on politically, and to be thought-provoking, right? Here we are, we have Thomas Nass covering Boss Tweed in a Tammany ring of 1872. You can see everybody's pointing a finger at everybody else as they're engaged in graft and political corruption in America's cities. Uh, here, of course, we have one of my favorites. Oop, looks like I, okay, there we go. Uh, Robert Miners, at last a perfect soldier. Okay, obviously 1916, going into World War I, we're living in the United States, guys, and this is hard to conceive as well, where we had an active Communist Party and Socialist Party movement. People were against the war. And by the way, this ended up, this publication that Robert Miner actually put this in, and the work of Robert Miner, ended up going away. Why? The U.S. Postal Service would no longer deliver newspapers with this because of the Espionage Act, okay? And because of the Sedition Act that was passed under the Wilson administration, that any kind of First Amendment freedom like this somehow threatened American national security and our interests. And maybe if you've ever studied this in the past, you're familiar with of the case of Schenck versus the United States in which the Supreme Court literally in a unanimous decision said that in times of war, political speech could in effect, in fact, be censored, okay? Uh, we know that Eugene Debs ran for president of the United States at one point in 1920, he received over a million votes from a jail cell because his political speech was found to be in contradiction of these acts, okay? So, also, William Randolph Hearst, New York Journal. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with the first war started by the news media, the Spanish-American War, where literally to sell newspapers, uh, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst used their publications to invent a phony attack on the USS Maine in Havana Harbor, Cuba. Okay? In fact, guys, the Spanish always deny the incident. What happened? Its boiler blew up. Okay? Hearst and Pulitzer, sensing that this was a craze and that they could sell newspapers and that they can make a lot of money, literally fictionized, right? Look at some of the advertising. $50,000 reward. Destruction of the warship Maine was the work of an enemy, okay? Uh, clearly, none of these events actually took place. 
And even in the time, in the early days of print journalism, this is our first example of the media conjuring a conflict. So let's look at some of the media freedoms we have here in the United States briefly. We know that in the US, uh, we have a pro uh, prohibition of what we would call prior restraint. What is prior restraint? That means that our news media does not filter what we have here in the United States, or excuse me, our government does not filter the content of our news media before it's disseminated, okay? We punish our media on the back end if there's going to be any kind of retribution. But we don't have, say, what would be taking place in a lot of authoritarian regimes even today, or probably most famously in our lifetime, the Soviet Union, where news was literally read before it was allowed by a government censor, before it was able to be published. We've never had that, okay? Um, the other thing that we have on the back end when we talked before about how do we keep our media uh, in restraint, it's usually not through criminal courts, it's through civil courts, through the use of what we refer to as a tort. If we can demonstrate that the media has defamed somebody, then we as private individuals can go after that individual for damages resulting from defamation. Of course, we know that uh, uh, slander is spoken defamation, libel is written defamation. Okay. So the previously mentioned Espionage Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918, uh, basically, as I've said before, uh, made political speech, which the federal government uh, claimed was in somehow a national security risk, uh, that political speech could be curtailed. Uh, friends, in the 21st century, uh, we still are engaged in this today. Uh, we know that there was a movie made about Edward Snowden who basically leaked uh, to the uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald, a journalist with The Intercept, uh, that the United States government was collecting all kinds of metadata on us, personal information that was being collected. Of course, we know that uh, James Clapper, other US uh, intelligence officials, went to Congress, literally said we were not doing that, as a government. We were doing that as a government, okay? James Clapper today is a millionaire appearing on cable news networks as an analyst. Edward Snowden, who leaked the information, can't return to the United States because he'll be arrested upon his landing on U.S. soil, right? Uh, perhaps if you haven't heard of the case of Danny Hale, uh, he's a gentleman who was just sent to prison for four years. Why? He leaked to the news media that he had evidence that he had gotten from the Department of Defense that 90% of US drone strikes in the United States that we were launching at enemies overseas, 90% of them were resulting in civilian casualties. And this information wasn't be given to the American public. Many people in the United States had bought onto the idea of sterilized warfare, you know, being able to basically take care of the bad guys, but in a way which wouldn't put US or, or anyone else at risk, you know, precision weaponry, not the case. Danny Hale right now has been sentenced to four years in prison for leaking this information. He's sitting there today because under the Espionage Act, it doesn't matter what the reason is of the individual who leaked. The, very, the only thing that the courts look for is did they in fact leak, regardless of the call, if the cause was righteous or not. Okay, so these are things that we're living with today. Other, media and the courts. Again, to preface this later conversation we're going to have. Uh, three big cases, Near versus Minnesota, uh, basically said that states were unable, that there was no way that they could seek an injunction to prevent a newspaper from actually printing something before it was printed. Uh, the New York Times versus Sullivan basically set up what was the accountability standard for journalists. A journalist is allowed, according to the courts, to actually get something wrong, okay? I can run a source if I'm a journalist and be wrong about the information I'm running. However, if I'm malicious or if I knowingly publish information up front, which is erroneous, then I can be held accountable for my actions as a journalist, was a ruling by the court. And then, of course, some of you in here uh, today may be almost old enough to remember what the Pentagon Papers were uh, in the case of the New York Times versus the United States. Uh, typically, if this was a full class, I would show a little video regarding the Pentagon Papers. Uh, but this was essentially that the United States government, uh, uh, that the New York Times was able to print information which is, uh, showed that the U.S. government in a negative light, that in fact, well, our leaders, presidents of both parties, going back to Eisenhower, had been telling the American people they were trying to de-escalate the Vietnam War in fact, privately, they were escalating our involvement in the Vietnam War, okay? So, the decline of print media, okay? Today, I'm looking at some of you in this room, and you guys uh, probably have never actually purchased an actual newspaper in your life, a paper version of the newspaper, okay? And when you're talking about TVs, tablets, uh, uh, other devices, handheld phones, why would you, right? You don't need to, you know, it's a, I mean, how can you even read that on the beach? The wind blows it everywhere. I mean, you've got a tablet now. You don't need to have it. Um, so the internet, the advent of new technologies, put uh, print media in a, in a, in a, in a bad way. 
Uh, the other thing which really started to happen both with print and electronic media was the decline of the adversarial relationship. Now, I don't want to go too far into this, but when you look back at the 20th century, most journalists who worked for print publications got their start literally like, uh, you know, working in the print room. You know, you didn't, most of these individuals never went to college, okay? They were just people who wanted to cover the news, and there was almost an animosity with the people that they grew up with. They wanted to cover the people who were the wealthy and political power because they actually wanted to stick it to them, all right? There was a kind of resentment there, and they, they took the watchdog function almost to fanatical levels in terms of how, like for example, if you have an elected official today and they see a media figure coming, they may walk up to them because, because it's a kind interview. Back then you'd run. Nobody wanted to see the print journalist. My God, what were they going to print about you? You would have no idea, okay? This actually kind of changed during Watergate. I don't have it on the slide. But America watched Woodward and Bernstein blow up the Nixon administration, and now there's a whole new group of young people who want to be the next Woodward and Bernstein, and they're graduating from the same elite institutions that the wealthy individuals they cover are also going to. There was a, and, and of course, today, we don't have time to get into this today, but we can see the hopscotch being played between White House press secretary and large cable news network, or large cable news network, and then going back and working for a government a figure again. It's kind of hard to cover something adversarial, uh, when you want to have access, but then you also want to be a millionaire at the other end of it, okay? Uh, obviously, the New York Times, when we talk about print media, began a paywall uh, in 2012. Uh, today, almost every major newspaper, you no longer have free access to their digital content. You have to have some sort of subscription-based model. And guys, I'm going to tell you, this is a problem. Uh, we need local media. It performs an invaluable function that I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation relative to Jacksonville. A couple figures from what I like to call the golden age of electronic media. Uh, if you guys don't know who this is, this of course is uh, Edward R. Murrow, and this is Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, who was the chair of the uh, Committee on Un-American Activities, which was trying to discover communists in every aspect of our society. Uh, Murrow, by the way, you can see how times have changed. You know, I don't think anybody smokes cigarettes anymore on the uh, network television, uh, but Murrow took McCarthy down. He dedicated an entire evening one time to the lies which were being said by McCarthy. Uh, other journalists jumped on board. And in time, uh, journalism, you know, in terms of the uh, electronic age, the TV, uh, and by the way, why was McCarthy, or why was Edward Armour so popular? Again, if you're young, you guys have to realize until the 1970s, there were only four networks in the United States, okay? Moms and dads had to watch the same programs together because there was only four channels. Okay. And this is also something very, very important for you to note. One of the big things that changed the news media in the United States was that electronic media stopped being broadcast for everyone. We began to find niche markets for our mass media so that we're no longer being able to play for everyone, mom, dad, Democrat, Republican. With the advent of cable, now we can create a business model which only targets the customers that we want to target with advertisers who want to target those same customers, okay? The demise of electronic media, what do I see as the major problem here? Uh, one was the elimination of the fairness doctrine. Imagine this for a second, from 1949 to 1987 in the United States, having to display both or, or cover both sides of a political debate on the same program, okay? It's almost, uh, it's almost impossible to imagine now thinking about Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow having somebody on their program who's going to be getting in the other side of the issue, okay? Uh, it just, it's, it's, we can't conceive of it. But that's the way it was, and Reagan actually eliminated it. He thought that it would make, uh, uh, you know, journalism, uh, you know, Reagan was off, I mean, he would deregulate anything, just on principle, but he also extended this to the media. Uh, interestingly enough, Congress reauthorized the Fairness Doctrine, and Reagan vetoed it, okay, because he was so against having any kind of regulation over the media. And of course, this is in the best spirit of bipartisanship. Uh, Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act in 1996, which again was supposed to uh, increase, all right, uh, increase uh, uh, media vitality. And all it basically ended up doing was having large corporate giants gobble up literally every media outlet in the United States. And we'll get to that in a second as well. Uh, in the last 25 years, we've seen a strong ten trend towards chain ownership of outlets. Uh, and I'll provide you guys with a little information here in a second. We now basically have five corporate behemoths in the United States who own 90% of America's media. And here they are, the corporate oligopoly. Now these corporations will change in time as they acquire, 
One of the other things which is important to note, because I, I, sometimes I have students who struggle with this idea because they look at these as discrete ventures, okay? Company, 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 okay? We need to realize that all of these companies have holdings and are invested in the properties of, other, of these other companies, okay? It is completely intertangled to suggest, you know, that there may be a company affiliated with News Corp, which also has a large holding in a company which is owned by AT&T, okay? Uh, and of course, National Amusements, uh, you know, I, I, the list is really, really extensive. When you get into some of the properties, and I said before 90%, you know, News Corp owns obviously Fox News, Sky News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, uh, Harper Collins Publishing, National Geographic, uh, that's News Corp. When you go to National Amusements at the bottom, and by the way, these names are kind of innocuous. Most Americans may not even know that there's a company called National Amusements, but for sure they know what CBS is and Paramount and MTV and BET and GameSpot and Showtime, okay, and Viacom and Comedy Central where kids like to go watch Trevor Noah, okay, and other programs like that, right? Not your National Amusements. You get into AT&T and they're holding CNN, HBO, the Cartoon Network, TNN, T TNT, TBS, all right? Time Warner, who AT&T had to acquire to become one of these big bohemus, the Time Warner cable network system, right? Uh, Comcast, NBC, MSNBC, USA, Bravo, Spotlight Films, Focus Features, and then finally, uh, everybody's favorite uh, you know, corporation, the mouse, Disney. I've had students before say, does Disney own everything yet? I said, not yet, but they're trying. They're desperately trying, okay? ABC, and of course, if you're a young person, you know that, and it, well, even if you're not so young of a person, uh, we're familiar with a lot of their properties, right? Uh, 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 you know, DreamWorks, Marvel, right? Uh, what else? Lucas Films is now owned by Disney, okay? As well as ABC and Touchtone and Vice and the History Channel and other properties. So literally, when you go down the list, and this is obviously not extensive, I could have spent a lot more time on this. These five companies, guys, basically own the lion's share of every kind of media in the United States that we consume. There's an enormous amount of power which is held by the people who are operating these companies. And the first thing we'll get into is what is, I, I was going to try to talk about framing today a little bit, the way that the news media will frame a story. I will in a second, but let's get into the, what I consider to be the most powerful function of the news media, setting the agenda. They are literally the ones who are choosing when you sit down to watch a news broadcast or any kind of programming, what it is you're going to be watching. As much as you guys, we know that there's a, there's a obviously if you sit down and watch The Daily Show with Jon Stewart or if you were to sit down today and watch Trevor Noah on The Daily Show, okay, that's a comedic program and we like to laugh. And we can also be informed by what it is that they're bringing to our attention. But who is setting the parameters for what we're watching? They are, okay. The traditional A block, B block, C block on your evening news, even your nightly news, who is choosing that content? They are, okay? And what that leads to is it leads to a very, very tight filter that we'll talk about here in a second when we get into Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, uh, that the news media has the ability to control what we see. Um, I wanted to share this with you guys back when I was a young, uh, just emerging from undergraduate school in Pennsylvania. I remember, and I had to go back and actually uh, uh, quantify this and make sure that I was accurate. The third leading story in the United States before 9-11, guys, was shark attacks. No data to support that shark attacks were up, but let me tell you something, if you went anywhere near the water, even looked at the water, or thought about putting your foot in the water, by God, a great white shark was going to bite off your foot. That's what we were told every single night on the news. And then magically something happened. Tragically, Osama bin Laden attacked the United States with Al-Qaeda. They, you know, they flew the planes into the Twin Towers, into the Pentagon, the plane crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. But apparently one of the other things that happened is sharks stopped biting people that day <laughs> because the media never covered it again. It just kind of went into the ether, okay? Um, perhaps, despite the fact that we know that COVID is moving from the pandemic to the endemic stage, we can also recognize this with the coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Kind of amazing how for a second COVID got completely pushed out of our news feeds to cover what the latest and the hottest and the greatest story was, the invasion of an Eastern European nation thousands of miles away from the United States, okay? Um, I want to show you guys a real quick video just to illustrate this, uh, the power of the shark attack. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, uh, actually this is very much like my regular lecture, because if you ever saw me in a classroom trying to work these, it's no different, okay? Uh, so the, the little funny way to illustrate with you guys the power of agenda setting and kind of what the context was for that summer, because that was literally what you felt like living in the United States prior to the attack. Um, what I really wanted to get to spend a little bit of time today was uh, uh, what I consider to be some of the most pertinent literature when it comes to the news media in the United States, both its function that it has on American society and its interplay with the United States government. Uh, the first, if any of you guys have studied this yet in school, if you've probably gone through your undergraduate education, you've at least heard of the name Noam Chomsky. Uh, and what Chomsky and uh, Edward Herman did is they wrote a book called Manufacturing Consent, which is literally talking about how both our government elites and our corporate elites use five filters to keep the information that they want us to be consuming relevant to us, but then punish individuals who try to bring us contrary information or information that may not be in their best interest to maintain either a corporate, a political, or a cultural elitism, which they enjoy, but quite frankly, which we typically do not enjoy. So let's look at this for a second. Let's talk about ownership, advertising, official sources, flack, and fear, okay? So the first, and this is going to be my separate of the, of the propaganda model, as described by Chomsky and Herman, is ownership. We know that ownership is incredibly important because they set the agenda for what stories are going to be covered. And if you are a newspaper reporter, you are going to want to make sure that the financial interests of your bosses are being satisfied because they are your financial interests. Again, this isn't the mid part of the 20th century where you've got you know, cranky old newspaper reporters with cigars chewed to a nub walking around trying to like cover everything which is going on in the news. Rachel Maddow, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon are multi-millionaires. Their interest is also the interest of their ownership group. Now, when we get away from the content creators, let's talk about those individuals who are actually in the broadcast of this business. And I offer you guys another video here which is brief that you may have seen previously. The 15 minutes he spent showing me how to do this was wasted, clearly. <laughs> Since I have I've retained the minute. Fox and Antonio's Jessica Headley. Ed O'Brien Wolf. I'm really interested. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS 4 News produces. Thank you. The sharing of bias and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of bias and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 Oh, there we go. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone seen that video before, just out of curiosity? It's yeah. kind of jarring when you actually watch it. Sinclair, and, right? All yes. Sinclair. Yes, and the Sinclair Media, a conservative news outlet, uh, piggybacking on the, the, the uh, cries from Donald Trump that we had a news media which was being unkind and unfair to him, uh, was engaged in fake news. And, and of course we know, we're, we're, and again, I will be an equal opportunity offender for everybody in the room. Uh, we know that, quite frankly, the, the former president, quite often, any news that he did not like to hear about himself was, of course, fake. Okay? Uh, and he had other individuals and other outlets who helped him promulgate that kind of thought. Uh, usually when I show this, and you just think about this, let's just say you live in rural Iowa. 
if, if this isn't exposed, you would have no idea that in the United States that every media outlet owned by this you know, innocuous company was providing you with this kind of content. Con uh, content. So that's your first filter okay, within the news media and what they provide us. The second is obviously advertising. Okay? Advertisers, advertisers want a certain kind of product. They want a, a media product to be put out there because they want to be able to reach the people that they want to sell a product to. Obviously, you are not going to see MSNBC running ads for my pillow, okay? That is, and you are not going to be seeing Fox News run things which are going to be contra to what the people who want to buy Michael Lindell's fabulous pillow to be able to to see on their programming. Um, the third, and this is something that I think a lot of people lose track of, is the use of official sources. Quite frankly, in the United States, our news media will breathlessly run anything which is provided them by an FBI or a CIA agent or by the, our intelligent agencies. Uh, you know, there's just so many examples. You know, one I would say, you know, Pete Williams, who now is a millionaire on NBC, was literally the press secretary for the Pentagon as the United States invaded Panama. He talked about, you know, entire neighborhoods, executions, mass graves that our news media went out and reported without ever verifying. Of course, we knew at the end of the day that this was complete makeup. This was all made up. Okay? It was literally used and broadcast by our media to justify the, Reagan's, excuse me, the Bush administration's entry into Panama. Okay? And you know, we see this today uh, with other sources. Uh, Russian bounties, the, uh, you know, the denial recently coming out in the newspaper of the authenticity of Hunter Biden's laptop. Okay? Now let me be very, very clear about this for a second, friends. I'm not suggesting anything on Hunter Biden's laptop reaches any kind of level of criminality. I'm not even suggesting that it's really that interesting or it's even that newsworthy. But the fact that we did know that he had a laptop that was recovered from a store prior to the election and all of our news media chose to repress that information just until the last two weeks when the Washington Post and the New York Times were finally forced to come out and say, yes, this is in fact an authentic laptop that belonged to Hunter Biden, that had elaborate information about business dealings he had in nations that his dad is vice president of the United States was negotiating with at a top governmental level. Now listen, that doesn't illustrate that anything necessarily took place there which, which would indemnify Hunter or President Biden. But what it does suggest is that our news media made a conscious decision to keep the information about that laptop under wraps until it's such a time that they were able to, in fact, after the election, quite frankly. Okay? And of course here is now the headline. When I talk about using official sources, this is from Politico. I couldn't crop everything into it, but it's from the website Politico. More than 50 former intelligence officers signed a letter casting doubt on the prominence of the New York Post story. This is what they did to basically create doubt prior to the election. Now, of course, today we know that all these media outlets are having to confess that these 50 former intelligence officers were wrong and that most of them have, were supportive of the Democratic Party, the ones that they found, okay? The fourth is flack. Uh, and FLAC, you know, is basically creating an environment where a reporter can't function because they're afraid of getting in trouble. Um, you know, oftentimes FLAC will, will come in the forms of ad hominem attacks, making fun of the individual as well. You know, for example, if I were to expose a, a story which was prominent, uh, ultimately, if the news media, if, if my story can't be discredited, discredit Daniel Cronrath. That's, that's the number one way that you can invalidate the information that's be prevented, pre being presented is to go after the integrity or to make fun of the presenter. Okay? Um, what else do we see? Well, provide you guys with a picture of the late Ed Schultz. Uh, worked at MSNBC for a period of time, was terminated by MSNBC, most people don't realize this, because MSNBC was, and we know this through WikiLeaks, Julian Assange's organizations, they were actively working with the Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee to get Hillary Clinton the nomination in 2016. Ed Schultz was the only media figure on MSNBC who actually went to Bernie Sanders' presidential announcement in Burlington, Vermont. He was told not to go by the network executives at NBC. He went, he covered the event, and 45 days later his contract was terminated. Okay? Because he broke with ranks and he went and he covered, again, 2016. This was, remember, Hillary's going to be the nominee in 2008. Then in 2016, nobody else even credible got into the race except Bernard Sanders. Okay? And by the way, one of the reasons why that race was contested is because when you only have two choices, there's naturally going to be a default to somebody who's not Hillary Clinton within the Democratic primary circles. Schultz loses his job, gets hit with what we refer to as flack. 
And then the last filter, which is used, is fear. If you can just simply make people in general afraid of things, then you can basically target them with any kind of information that you want to put out. Uh, and this will work in a variety of ways, whether it's fear of communism, whether it's fear of Russians, whether it's fear of illegal immigration, okay, the immigrants who are coming to take our jobs, or to do whatever kind of narrative that you want to be able to use to create that fear, it's a means of subjugating and controlling an audience. Okay? When Chomsky originally wrote with Herman Manufacturing Consent, they of course talk, commented uh, on communism because that was the global threat the Soviet Union and the United States were in the Cold War. Today, Chomsky has imagined it as, as anything which basically that you can use to generate fear, you're going to be able to use to terrify and to subjugate the people who you're presenting media to. Now, it's pretty dark, it's pretty heavy there, I'm even going to get worse. Okay. And then I'm going to turn it around for everybody and I'm going to make you feel a little bit better. Okay. Uh, probably a more recent book by one of my favorite authors, Matt Taibbi, was a book called Hate, Inc. Uh, Taibbi caught a lot of grief for the, for the cover of the book, in which he basically has, obviously you can see, uh, Sean Hannity and Rachel Maddow depicted, that literally today in cable television, which for the young people in this room who don't consume cable, this won't mean as much to you. But pretty much everybody in the United States, still traditionally my age and older, is watching cable television at night. Particularly those demographics that vote. Because I'm sad to say, guys, we know young people talk about voting, but then something miraculously happens between them and participating in an election. Okay? We don't know what. Uh, but Taibbi wrote a book basically where he posits for all of us to consider what he calls the 10 rules of hate which exist in our news media. By design, it's a contrivance. News media tries to keep us at each other's throats in order to satiate a profit model. Okay, there's a profit motive to all of this. So really it begins in Taibbi's definition with the creation of Fox. And not to go too long about this, but just imagine Fox's former executive, Roger Ailes, who you guys may have seen depicted in the movie Bombshell recently in the last four or five years. Uh, he's a young staffer working for the Nixon administration, and he's watching his boss get pounded every day. And he says, golly, boss, wouldn't it be great someday if we could have a Republican television network? And Nixon's like, well, yeah, Roger, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Twenty years later, Roger Ailes meets a gentleman in Australia by the name of Rupert Murdoch and Fox News is born. And what is their business model? And I told you I would get back to this. Rather than trying to do content which appealed to everybody in the United States, Abel says, you know what we ought to do? Let's divide that in half and just own the Republican part. Let every other news outlet go back and they can try to compete with this Republican audience or they can, they can work on the other half, you know, the, the center to center left in the United States, but we're going to own this. And that business model, 25 years later, Fox News remains the number one watched cable network in the United States because they own that audience. Okay? They've been able to withstand threats from outlets like One America News and Newsmax, which still have a, a, a fringe audience, but Fox News remains the gold, the gold standard of cable. And what's really interesting is the other thing that they invented, and if you think about this, it's, it's hideous, but it's also rather crafty. Uh, when the network got started, they hired no reporters. They're like, why would we send out a reporter? We'll just cover what the CBS reporter says and editorialize it. Okay? Look what that AP reporter just said. That's terrible. What a bad take. Okay? Where's your reporter? Don't need one. Our entire business model is just making fun of the other outlet's reporter. Okay? So in time, Fox obviously has a full newsroom now. They've added people. They've added reporters. But wow, that was their original business model. Keep costs low and editorialize everything that our competition's doing. That's what we'll do to appeal to a right-leaning audience. Okay? So with that, you've hit the arrow where we're at right now. And this, is, this is, again, this is Tybee. I, I think a lot of this just resonates me with so much that, that once you really get in and if you read the book, you'll see what Tybee is getting at. But I'll tease it out. And, you know, the first thing is, is that there's only two baskets of ideas. Okay? This is the, what he calls the team sport nature of things in the United States politically right now. Okay? Think about everything you see as a Republican or a Democrat, but now let's make it Gator or Bulldog. Okay? There's absolutely no way, no matter how bad your team is or how scandalous it is, if you're a Florida fan, that you're ever going to root for the Georgia Bulldogs. Okay? Gator, Gator, Gator. It's always going to be the Gators. Okay? And that's kind of the concept which has permeated our politics, sadly. And by the way, our politics is a lot more important than team sports. Okay? I wish as a political scientist that I could get people as actually inter interested and as knowledgeable about American politics as they are about the backup offensive linemen for the Mercer Bears or whatever, you know, whatever sport that you happen to be following. Or you know, who you, you're going to be getting on loan from Liverpool to Fulham in soccer. Okay? If we all had that kind of uh, uh, understanding of our politics, it would be a really different world. Um, and of course you guys can see that these ideas must always be in conflict. 
Okay, the only way that you can really keep the clicks up and keep the advertisers happy and keep the viewership up is conflict. You've got to maintain that. Um, Ty B will also point out that it's very, very important that you hate people, but not the institutions. Okay? Criticize the members of Congress, but without necessarily criticizing the function of Congress. Okay? What he would be saying. Uh, it's easy to cheer, it's easy to boo. Number four and number five are, are kind of a, a, a you know, uh, you know, co-mingle here. Uh, one, everything is someone else's fault, but nothing can be everyone's fault. You have to have somebody to blame. And one of the other things that Taibbi really explores here is this idea of our politics now being turned into professional wrestling. Scripted, choreographed theater. For the sake of brevity, I didn't have time to pull up the photos of Donald, uh, of Bill and Hillary Clinton at Donald and Melania Trump's wedding of Michael Bloomberg, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump playing a round of golf together, okay, as recently as seven years ago. You know, the whole idea of what TB is suggesting is that a lot of this is stagecraft. It's kabuki theater, okay, it's kabuki period of clicks. But what's really beautiful about this is that if you want to switch the role of what in wrestling we would refer to as the face or the heel, the face being the good guy and the heel being the bad guy, turn the network and you can see the roles reversed. Now your face can be somebody else's heel, and that's the way that we'll keep perpetuating this. Uh, but obviously, this is maybe one of the biggest importance. No, one, no one's allowed to think. If you start thinking, you sink. You just cheerlead. No independent thought. Never criticize your own team. Just root. Just cheerlead. That's, that's what you should be doing, and you're not allowed to switch teams. This, in one way, is actually where I think Taibbi's model drifts a little bit, and I would have to disagree with the author on this. There has been a real embrace, if you guys, and I don't know what your political leanings are, it really is irrelevant, but you'll see a lot more now on CNN and MSNBC, kind of the deification of people like Liz Cheney, because Liz Cheney doesn't like Trump. Now, 15 years ago, when I was a good Democrat in the Democratic Party, uh, Dick and Liz Cheney, I mean, I was running with a group of people who wanted them arrested for war crimes, because they invaded Iraq. Now, today, we see Democrats embracing them, simply because they don't like Trump. Like, that's the litmus test now. Oh, you, 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 you still are you're against everything I am for ideologically, but you don't like Trump? Welcome, let's go to lunch, okay? That's kind of the, the phase that we've entered into with the, with the switching of the teams. Um, okay, when I was growing up, you know, if you ever wanted to throw uh, an incendiary bomb in a conversation, you mentioned Hitler, okay? Taibbi does it, and he believes this is one of the reasons why today that we have such vitriol. The other side is literally Hitler, and by the way, when you're fighting Hitler, that means that you can basically say and do anything back. Okay, so if you look at the polarization, if you if you if you you know popularized by right wing first, uh, you know the, the idea you know we're somehow going to be canceling Christmas. I mean, every year there's a war on Christmas in the United States. You know, uh, uh, traditional values to, to anything in the United States, and basically then, then then to punch back at that, the Democrats demonize Trump. They demonize people who are less educated who would support Trump, and they kind of put them down. And this is the biggest thing at the very end, and I want you guys to understand this. What you've got to do at the end of this model is feel superior about yourself. Walk around a little bit smug. Guess, guess what? Because you know that you're right and your team's right. It's been reinforced by everything you've watched. You know you're the good person. Show them the tude. You're right, okay? You're right and they're wrong. You've got to have that kind of superiority and that kind of smugness. So now, guys, what I want to try to do is I want to try to bring everybody back up. And I want you guys to think a little bit. The first thing we all need to do is we need to recognize what cognitive dissonance is. And we need to recognize what confirmation bias is. We tend to go and we tend to watch programs that make us feel good and to support our already pre-existing mentalities, okay? Uh, if, you know, and I pick to do this all the time, I use my family members. If you're my mom, you're gonna be turning on Fox News. You're gonna be turning on MSNBC. Or uh, you're gonna be turning on Newsmax. If you're my sister, you're hoping Hillary Clinton's gonna run again and you're watching MSNBC every night, okay? And that's all the places that are going to be, I imagine sometimes trying to make my mom watch something she doesn't want to see. And she literally, you can see the cognitive dissonance. You can see the physical discomfort with her processing information which does not match her worldview. Uh, fun fact on the side, maybe some of you have seen this just broken the last week, that there were two political scientists who actually did a study where they paid Fox News viewers to watch one month of CNN. Had to literally pay them $15 an hour living wage to get them to do it, okay? Uh, 
and how their mindsets changed just in a month. Like there was a site, like 10% of them had a completely different outlook on a lot of the news that they were watching because the frame of that content had changed, okay? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Most of the big corporations set the same agenda. Democrats think illegal Im uh, immigration brings value. Republicans are a little bit more suspicious of it. But both networks spend time covering immigration. It's just the frame in which they present it. Um, for, for, for please, differentiate hard news from infotainment. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, Rachel Maddow and Tucker Carlson in the last two years have both been sued by people who have tried to bring lawsuits against them for defamation and the judges have thrown it out, saying that anybody who actually thinks that Carlson and Rachel Maddow are hard news people, they're not. They're entertainers. They're only providing you content to entertain. And I can tell you what's unfortunate about that is that the vast majority of Americans believe these figures. They believe that this is hard news which is being reported. So where can you go and get the hard news? I still recommend old fashioned, go to the wire services. If you want to know what's going on in Ukraine today, and you don't want to have it editorialized by an American talking head, go to Reuters, go to the AP. Look and see what the journalists who are in the field are actually broadcasting from the field before you get that content editorialized. There's all kinds of good content. To, and by the way, I, I put this out as an open question. A lot of folks, uh, we had a great presentation here at Deerwood last Friday by a gentleman by the name of, uh, uh, oh my goodness, um, reporter for the Times Union, Matt, uh, I'm sorry, it's just, what's that? No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, Nate Monroe, excuse me, Nate Monroe from the Florida Times Union. Just got done basically by himself and with a small newsroom at the TU, totally blowing up the, the sale of JEA and the bonus gate scenario for the Jacksonville Times Union. We need these people. We need local journalists. We need them doing that kind of job in our city hall, all right? They are performing that watchdog function and they're performing it well. Uh, there are other places that most of you guys, especially if you're younger, can go to find information. But just always remember, even if you go to a non-corporate source and you're just going to somebody whose opinion you like, whether that's you know, the Young Turks or Joe Rogan or, or uh, Russell Brand or Jon Stewart or wherever you're going for your information, please appreciate you're still being largely infotained despite the fact that there may be good nuggets of information contained within there. And then last, guys, you know, I put this at the bottom. Don't, don't be morose. Play with a puppy. Hold a baby, take a walk on the beach, go outside on a sunny day, breathe deeply, okay? Uh, you know, don't let the news bring you down. I think one of the problems, you know, with a lot of us is that we take things sometimes so seriously, particularly as we age and we're less active or during the times of COVID, when it's harder for us to get outside, and we really take this stuff and we really let it burden, if we really make it burdensome. If you get in a joy disagree with, with somebody, what I try to do in my class is I always try to create a safe space, a space where we can be ideologically honest, we can explore topics together, and we can leave there. And we don't want to necessarily kill each other while we're doing it, okay? Uh, because even though we're on the American dinner table today, what is everybody told in the United States? There's two things you're not allowed to talk about, right? With your crazy uncle. Politics and religion. I would argue that they're two most important things we should be talking about. What we're doing while we're here and what happens to us when we die. Like, those are two big kind of concepts that it seems unfortunate, but we'll spend all of our time talking about who the backup offensive lineman is on the Georgia Bulldogs, because that's safe. So with that, I revisit The Shark, okay? Four fantastically awful films, uh, the Sharknado series. You and a chainsaw can prevent this from happening. Just remember that. Uh, I would gladly take any questions that you guys may have. We do have a couple of minutes if anybody wants to push back or ask me a question or, uh, uh, Anything, please. Um, yes, please. I don't have a question. I just have a comment. As far as the local news goes, I mean, it's, and I understand it, but younger people don't want to pay for it, but it does cost a lot of money to get that kind of reporting, so the, the cost of the small local papers is going up a lot. And I see it where my mother lives in Fort Myers. Her local paper is like $500 a year. Mm. And a lot of the old people can't afford it. So these other groups have come in and they have three weekly papers. And the, the people are reading that because they're old and they like the paper. And when I look at it, it's crazy the kind of the vitriol in there mm. and the outright lies. And, you know, if you don't pay for news, one way or another, whether you pay for digital news, you, you have to pay something or you're just going to get what you pay for. And it, it's, it's horrifying to me to see 
Every day, my mother's husband goes out, he rides his bike, he says, oh, I brought all the papers. And it's just awful. You know, <laughs> it's not news. Awful. Well, and, and one of the challenges that I didn't, I didn't get into that I could have was, was the, the disappearance of the classified section. You know, it used to be most American newspapers, you would were, were buy a classified ad, which today, Craigslist, Facebook, shopping, whatever the case may be, that big source of income for these local newspapers, beyond just the fact that the print newspaper is going the way of the dodo bird, their revenue stream is being lost with classifieds, basically returning to this era of first and Pulitzer journalism, where things have to be yellow, they have to be crudely exaggerated in order to make the sale. Your point is, is excellent. You had a question? I did. I'll get the camera frame. <laughs> um, so I was trying to learn all the new fallacies, like it's, uh, or not new fallacies, all the fallacies, like it's the new test points that I meant to say. Because I think it's all extremely important to kind of understand what they all are so that we can all kind of discern kind of like good facts and good information mm -hmm. and be able to process things logically and properly and be able to kind of like help again, discern what's good information and what's not so good information and also have out the discussions. And so um, is there anything that you recommend, any source or material that you think would help us in that regard? Yeah, if you just go online and Google logical fallacy, and I would say do this as your Google search, logical fallacy games. Okay. There's a bunch, you're welcome to stop by my office sometime. I actually have a deck of playing cards. Different games that you can play, understanding what biases are, understanding what logical fallacies is. One is the kind of where you just basically sit for an hour and watch a news program and every time you see you use one, you have to lay down, be the first person to lay down your card. So it would be like what, for example? Uh, oh, example would be like a what aboutism. Well, we know that Donald Trump is a bad, but what about? And then you basically go away from that and you go into where, you know, uh, you know, I use this example in my classroom. I pretend that I'm a, I'm a defense attorney and I'm representing Rachel Tino. And she's guilty and I'm trying to represent Rachel in the court and I'm looking at the jury and I say, Listen, I understand you guys have heard a lot of damning information about Rachel today, but what about Jeffrey Dahmer? And then, you know, because that, that what aboutism is a way to deflect criticism from what it is that you're talking about. That's probably one of the ones I see, or and probably the biggest one I see also behind, beyond ad hominem attacks, attacking the person, is the straw man fallacy. Is basically creating a, a fake argument that somebody's not, you know, that somebody's not saying, you know. Um, so, for example, if you were to say, I'm, I'm for the right, uh, of every American to be able to have access to affordable health care. You know, what would the straw man be? Oh, you're a communist. You just basically want to, you want to, you want to you know, get rid of private industry in the United States. Well, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I don't care what the vehicle is necessarily as long as everybody can go to a doctor and afford it. Well, no, you must be a socialist. You're, you're a Bernie Sanders socialist, right? I never, I never suggested that. I never said that. The, straw, the use of the straw man to create that exaggerated argument. But, man, there's a bunch. Uh, there. <laughs> There's as many logical fallacies out there as, as yeah, Can go ahead. That up? Yeah. So I really thought it was interesting you said that too, because using strong strawman fallacy happens to be a really good like, way to kind of help debaters, especially when they're not really seeing eye to eye. Like recently, um, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris were you know, having a debate. It was beautiful. It was great to hear. Mm -hmm. These two really great thinkers just kind of like, put their ideas together. And what I've noticed is that you know, once they really weren't kind of seeing eye to eye, they kind of almost did a strong man in it. In a good way, it's kind of like okay, try to figure me out, try to understand what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. and then we can try to correct each other moving forward. It's a very, it's a really good way of discourse. And so, and, and let me also add to that. What, what, one of the only places that you're going to be able to find that, and I'm very attracted to this as a new media form, is the is the long interview. Right. Okay. Uh, is the ability to get away from the two minute sound clips and actually get two people of two different ideological positions sitting down for an hour and a half or two hours. And yeah, for some people that may be long and painful to watch, but I would really argue it's a lot more informative when you create that kind of non-toxic environment where people can drill into an issue and drill into each other a little bit and try to find out who they are, right? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's great, so I just want to piggyback on that. And then I guess in that effort, that seems to be a lot of intellectual kind of work, which I think most people aren't really willing to do on an average basis. So especially when you're talking about young voters, people who are not going out there, if they see this game and they understand, a lot of young folks do, they have this large distrust in politics. What can we do to kind of like encourage them to really to vote if they don't really want to play ball? Because I think that's really what's kind of bugging them now, is that they don't want to have to go with mental gymnastics in order to figure out what's the best course of action. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I don't really have an easy answer for that. You know, do, do, to no, my, I expected you to have that. Yeah, yeah, listen, <laughs> you, I mean, you know, you know, you get the democracy you deserve. 
And if, in some ways, if, if you're not engaged in the political process, you can't sit back and say, well, woe is me, this isn't what I want to have happen here. Uh, obviously, young people have a lot of distractors in life. They're trying to get through, they're trying to do their best. Uh, there's a lot of things today with today's generation that I'm more sympathetic to. I mean, I, I hear people all the time my age and older, eh, these kids today, eh. you know, there, there are a lot of challenges being a young person growing up in the United States today that I don't think older people typically understand. It's not an excuse for their apathy, but it, it is kind of an explainer of that apathy. Uh, you know, they just look at this and they, you know, they know, you know they're confronting massive amounts of debt that their parents never had to confront or their grandparents never had to confront. They're still having conversations with the 70 year olds like, well, I paid for the University of Florida working part time on the weekend. Unless you're selling drugs, you're not going to be able to pay the University of Florida working part time on the weekend any longer, right? So how you get individuals and get young people involved you know, I mean, one of the things I like to tell them, and this is predates them, but uh, is the Al Gore example. Okay, Al Gore lost the state of Florida by less than 600 votes. So first of all, if you're going to suggest that every vote doesn't count, I, I wouldn't say that within like smacking distance of Al Gore, okay? Because there was no president Al Gore because he lost the state by such an arrow. Local races, just just go down. I mean, I try to show students like when they're talking about like why do I want to vote in a ra in a race between Tracy Paulson and Nick Allen. Why do I want to go out and vote in a city council special election like that? It doesn't really matter anyway. One, talk to them. I teach them what at the local level local government does. It's far more impactful in our lives than anything that Donald Trump tweets. I can promise you local government impacts our lives more directly more than anything that Joe Biden says at a press conference. It just does. Okay? And then show them that separation that you could literally be elected to city council sometimes by 10, 20, 30 votes. Your vote does matter. Okay? Uh, I know that's not a great answer to your question. I, mean, I, I agree with it. Yeah. That's the, uh, everyone's going to be stopping on the electoral college thing, and that's the end of it for them, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. We live in a state of Florida that has eight days of early voting, all kinds of opportunities to participate. We still don't have young people. Young people, I've taught, young people who have been in my political science club in the past who still somehow don't make it to vote. Oh, golly, I forgot yesterday was Tuesday. I mean, my dad? He lines up in the morning. If he's not like the first five people at his voting place, he's like, he's, I was number four today. Like, Dad, I was number 400. My vote counts exactly the same as yours. But it's a different mentality when you look at folks who are older and who are literally determining the future of this country for the actual people who are going to be here the next 70 years because we can't, we can't get them involved. We can't find a way to activate them. So, you know, I, I welcome suggestions for how to activate young people. What's worse is a lot of times there's only one person to vote for. They're unopposed. That's a different last lecture. <laughs> That's a different last lecture. But I, but I will tell you, again, number six is probably one of the most powerful rules here. Root, don't think. Perform, go out, do your, you know, no, necess no, no, you know, you don't have to engage intellectually. All you have to do is just follow who, who's the decisions being made for you. And I'm going to tell you, I think that's one of the things which turns young people off the most, okay? Most of the kids I have in my class, we, they may seem like they're uninterested, but it's not because they're not thinking about it, okay? Uh, this generation is very, very bright. I have more hope for this generation than some people my age and older, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Jury's still out. Any other questions? Yeah. No, I can see you want to ask something. I was just going to comment that um, the partisanship and the one news network doing everything, it doesn't fit well into looking at local politics. Yeah. Because you need a local person to do local politics. Yeah, yeah, you do. And you need to have that commitment. And guess what? It doesn't pay well. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the reason why people don't look at local politics is because it doesn't pay well. Or the news media doesn't talk about it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's hard. Um, again, it's so important. The decisions at the local level from school board to city council, uh, you know. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.